In this chapter, we're going to talk about the tree of life. When we talk about the tree of life, we're really talking about a picture very similar to what you see on this slide. This is going to show us the evolutionary relationships between the various organisms that we have both alive today and those that have lived in the past. What we're really discussing here is phylogeny. And phylogeny is the evolutionary history of an organism. And so by evolutionary history, we're really talking about something that typically has a tree-like structure. And by tree-like structure, think about a family tree. That shows the relationships among individuals, and it also shows their ancestors. So that's what we're going to have here. We're going to have organisms. We're going to be able to see their ancestors and then what other organisms might also share those same common ancestors. Systematics is the science of naming or classifying organisms. It's a slash. And determining their evolutionary history. So when we talk about systematics, there's a lot of different tools that will come into play when we try to come up with the names or classification of an organism, and then also how to assemble them on an evolutionary or phylogenetic tree. Some of the tools that will be used will be fossils. We'll also take a look at morphology when we're trying to put together these trees. And then last but certainly not least, there will be various molecules that are involved and by molecules, usually we're talking about DNA. We could also be talking about something like a protein. Here's an example of a typical phylogenetic tree. We have three different organisms on this one. We have humans, mushrooms, and plants. And if we just had those three organisms in front of us and we weren't seeing them on this tree-like structure, and we wanted to know which two are the most closely related to each other, most people that you would ask would say that the plant and the fungi are the most closely related. Well, actually, as you can see on this tree, that's not the case. Humans and fungi are more closely related to each other than they are to plants. And we know this based on molecules. Um, so if we just look at morphology or how something appears, we might miss some of those relationships that do exist between the two. So what we're seeing on this tree is we're seeing which organisms are more closely related to each other. So which probably had a very common or similar evolutionary history. Carl Linnaeus was um, the father of what we call taxonomy. And we've mentioned Carl Linnaeus in um, earlier chapters as the father of taxonomy. And he was interested in basically classifying organisms. And one of the ways that he did that was that he looked at the morphology he looked at their appearances and he basically grouped organisms together. He came up with a two-part naming system. And that two-part name is what we now call a binomial. It's gonna have two parts to it. And then he also came up with this kind of layers of classifications. And we're gonna call that, um, spelling it wrong here, hierarchical classification of organisms. Okay, so we're going to have some tiers to our classification. He did publish his um, taxonomy results and his system in this system nature. And if we talk about the binomial nomenclature a little bit more, binomial nomenclature has a genus and it has a species. And this species is what we call the specific epithet. So what Carl Linnaeus said was that all organisms are going to have these two part names. And this will be common to a lot of different organisms. So you may have many organisms that have the exact same genus. And then this is going to be something that is unique. So when you take this combination, you will only have one organism, sorry, one species that has this two-part combination. Just to look at some examples, 
Homo sapiens, that would be human beings. We have Escherichia coli, and that's E. coli. You've um, probably certainly heard of E. coli before. We have Nicotiana tobaccum, that's the common tobacco, and then we Citrus sinensis would be the common orange that is eaten. So here's just a number of examples. Notice that the first one is going to be the genus name, and notice that that is capitalized. And then the second part is going to be the specific epithet, and notice that that one is not capitalized. So here we have an example of the hierarchical classification. If we look at the very bottom of all of this first, we have the domain eukarya. That's gonna include all eukaryotic organisms. And as you probably know already, there is a vast number of eukaryotic organisms, and those would include organisms in the past, so ones that are no longer living today, and then we also have all of the ones that are living today. Within the domain eukarya, we have different categories which we call kingdoms. And animals make up one of those kingdoms. So this organism that we have at the very top of all of this is going to fall into that animal category. We then have multiple phylums inside the kingdom Animalia. This is gonna be chordata, which will be vertebrates. Within that, we have a lot of different classes, mammals, is the one that we're gonna specifically look at. And just notice how we go from one tier to the next, and these are basically nested levels. So at the very top of all of this, we have the panther. And this would be its genus and species name. There's only one species that that's going to match, but we would have a lot of different species that will fall into this genus, many genuses that fall into this family, many families in this order, many orders in this class, and then many classes in this phylum, until ultimately we end up with the kingdom at the end, which has multiple phylums within it as well. So this is the system that Carl Linnaeus came up with. When he put this system together, he was really most focused on looking at the morphology of the organisms. So he was matching them up, categorizing them based on how they looked in relationship to each other. Here's just another example. This is a plant example. If we start at the bottom yet again, notice that we have eukarya for our domain. That's the exact same domain that we had on the last slide. But in this case, we have a different kingdom. So this is gonna be kingdom plantae, which is the plants. And then we have the breakdown further until ultimately at the very top, we have ZMAs, which is your common corn. Again, you only have one species that's gonna have that specific name to it, and then you'll have multiple species that fall into a genus, multiple genuses in the family, and so on. Here's a look at how this might relate to a phylogenetic tree. In this case, we're seeing how these different panther species evolved over time. And what we see here is that we have one ancestor back here, and that ancestor is believed to have given rise to the five different species that we see on this chart. Now, since we have just one ancestor giving rise to all of these, this is what we call a rooted tree. Okay, rooted again, because we have one place where we can trace all of these back to. Now, this direction is showing hypothetical time. So this would be older, over on this side, and over here it's going to show us more recent. What we can see on here is that we can see a lot of branch points or a number of branch points. Every branch point is going to indicate a common ancestor for the species that come out from that. What this doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us which species evolved first. It doesn't tell us the exact time that they evolved. But what it does tell us is it tells us which ones are more closely related to each other. So in this case, we would assume that these two are going to be more closely related than the others that we see on this diagram. So they're more closely related to each other. Now one problem with all of this is that when Linnaeus put together his classification system, he was basing this on looks. And sometimes looks don't correspond to evolutionary history. So it is very possible that you have a diagram such as this phylogenetic tree 
which doesn't really truly reflect the evolutionary history of an organism. And when that happens, then there has to be some rearranging that takes place, but we don't change that binomial nomenclature that we've given to an organism. So because of all of this, many scientists have decided to lean towards what's called a phylo code. And the phylo code is something that would be based entirely on evolutionary history. So this would eliminate those cases where we have things that are showing up close to each other on those phylogenetic trees just because they look like each other when in fact they're very different. To come up with a phyla code is a complicated process because we would have to rename a lot of organisms, so assign new names, and if we really want to be sure, sometimes um, one of the easiest things to look at would be the molecules involved in heredity. So in that case, you would have to go back to the DNA and compare DNA sequences between organisms. One thing that the phyla code would not do is it would have no nested levels to it. So we would have no categories. We wouldn't have kingdoms. We wouldn't have phylums and classes and orders and genuses. We would just have specific names for individual species. And again, this might cause some names to be changed for organisms, and it might cause us to have to rearrange our thinking in those classification systems that have been around for so long. Nevertheless, this is something that is um, beginning to catch a lot of um, pace with scientists, and many are starting to turn towards this naming system. If we look at this example here and we talk just a little bit more about phylogenetic trees, um, as we said before, if we can bring it back to a common ancestor, all of the species that we're seeing on here, this is going to be what we call a rooted tree. So this is a rooted tree that we're looking at in this case. Each one of these um, organisms that's going to be coming off of this, and I'm just going to not uh, give them letters here so we can refer to them. Each one of these is what we would call a taxon. So taxon would be singular. If we say taxa, that would be plural. What we can see when we look at this is we can see that some taxa are very closely related to each other. These would be what we would call sister taxa. So if we're looking at this, we can see that B and C are very closely related to each other. In fact, they're going to be more closely related to each other than they are to A. They would also be more closely related to each other than they would be to D, E, F, or G. We could also say, based on this branching diagram, that they are more closely related to A than they are to the rest of the taxon on this chart. And that is because they share a common ancestor more recently with A. So right here, we can see that B, A, B, and C all diverged from a common ancestor. Now, another thing that we can see here is what we call on the bottom, this would be what we call a basal taxa or taxon. This is because it doesn't really show any branching. We see it coming off of this rooted tree very, very early. That one's going to be less related to all of the other taxa on this. Um, than they are to each other. So A through F would be more closely related to each other than they would be to this G taxa down on the bottom. These are what we would call a polytomy, and that's because we have more than two. So in this case, we have three, and they're all coming off of one ancestor or one branch point back here at the beginning. Now, if we take these ideas and we compare them to a real phylogenetic tree, this is one for some different fly um, species. So this is also a rooted tree. Notice we have one place where all of these branches are coming off. And on the tips of the branches, those would be the species that have evolved. Now on here, this is our evolutionary time. So this would be older on this side. This would be the recent side over here. And if we just talk about some specifics here, this tree, any evolutionary tree like this, is meant to show a pattern 
of descent. And when we say it's meant to show a pattern of descent, we're saying that it's meant to show how these organisms might have evolved from common ancestors. What it's not showing is similarity in looks. So similarity in looks or similarity in morphology, that's not what we're showing here. You might find species very close to each other on a phylogenetic tree that might look very different. And that is just um, reflected in the natural selection pressures that they may have been subjected to. Keep in mind what we talked about in earlier chapters about how species can evolve from each other. And it is possible that they end up looking quite different from each other in the long run. The second thing that we want to keep in mind is that the branching doesn't show any ages. It does not indicate ages. So what we mean by that is that we're really getting relative um, time or relative ages here, definitely not, definitely not absolute ages. All that we can see on this is that we have, if we look at the top, a common ancestor here that was more recent than say this common ancestor back here. Other than that, we can't give them any type of age in years. So we can't say that one is, you know, 100 million years older than another. We can't say any of that. We also can't really say how old they are compared to what we might find on the bottom of this tree. So we can only look at how they are related to one another and in terms of a common ancestor and then also in terms of aging. And again, it's relative age here. The third thing that we want to keep in mind is that we can't assume one species or taxa gave rise to one right next to it. So what we mean by that is we can't come up here and we can't say, okay, this one here arose from this one. We can't say that at all. The only thing that we can be certain of when we look at this is that we know that they had a common ancestor back here. So with saying all of this, it's important to keep in mind that these trees are nothing more than a hypothesis. They are a hypothesis based on um, credible information. So all of the information that's available and then scientists take that and they construct this. So we may be using molecules of heredity. We might be using DNA. We might be looking at morphology. We might have fossils that we can use to put information together for all of this, but it is very possible that there could be some errors in all of this. And sometimes that happens. If it does happen, then the tree will be rearranged. So you will see if you begin to look at a lot of phylogenetic trees that they do constantly get rearranged just a little bit as new information becomes available.